church. My name is Glenn Norman. Uh, Michelle, just want to thank you for sharing. That's a beautiful story of redemption. Uh, and um, we are honored to have been part of your journey here at this church. So I've been introduced to a new show recently by my wife, um, The Bachelor. No, I'm just kidding. She wouldn't. <laughs> she doesn't watch that. Um, but uh, she introduced me to a show on Netflix. I think it's fairly new to Netflix, but it's actually an old show, and some of you will know it and some of you won't, but it's a show called The Andy Griffith Show. How, how, can you raise a hand if you know The Andy Griffith Show? Okay, S some, of, some of you young ones won't know this yet. It's a bit edgy for you, I just want to warn you. Um, but it really represents a different kind of America than the one we've been seeing in the news the last couple of weeks. Um, the news is full of political division, uh, white supremacist marches and violence, potential war with North Korea or military involvement in Venezuela, popular movements like Black Lives Matter, the widening of the economic gap between the haves and the have-nots. It's a messy time for America. And I watched the Andy Griffith show, and it's so gentle and respectful and kind and civilized. It's really quite an amazing antidote. And I asked Kathleen whether this America ever really existed, and she said she thinks it did. It seems that there was a time in America where there was general agreement on what was moral and right, when nearly all citizens embraced ethical values and ideas based on Judeo-Christian moral tradition. But now that is ignored or rejected by the majority, especially the influential and powerful of society. And whether we like it or not, whether we accept this truth or not, America is in a time of transition to a post-Christian culture. And I can perhaps see it maybe more easily than others because Europe has gone through that. Europe is a post-Christian culture. The shift in America, I believe, started to happen in the 1960s with the rejection of authority and the lack of trust in traditional institutions, including the government and the church. And over the last 50 or 60 years, the culture has become less and less Christian. This would be alarming, except for the fact that Christianity is used to this. Christianity was born into a culture that was hostile to it. Paul's visit to Thessalonica happened because he had been run out of town in Philippi. His stay was short, and then he was run out of town in Thessalonica and had to move on to Berea, and then Athens and Corinth. He is a man on the run, because everywhere he goes, riots ensue. The first century was not a culture that was friendly towards Christianity. There was persecution from the Jews, who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There was hostility from the Romans, who ended up crucifying Jesus at the urging of the Jews. There was skepticism from the Greeks, who thought that this new religion was insufficiently intellectual. And yet, 2,000 years later, from such unpromising beginnings, Christianity still exerts a massive influence over the globe. So we're going to dive into chapter 3 of the book of 1 Thessalonians and see that persecution and trials and difficulties are nothing new to those who wish to follow Christ. If you have a Bible with you, open it up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, or you can follow it on the screen behind me. This is the words of Paul. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come, from, come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? 
Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. So the first blank on your outlines this morning, if you're a taking notes kind of person, is persecuted by the culture. Persecuted by the culture. Any Christian in any culture who wishes to be true to Christ will face persecution. Jesus promised this. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Whenever you decide to live out of step with the prevailing culture, you will encounter trouble. You will experience trials. Now, the form of these trials may change over the centuries. Not many of us are thrown into an arena where we're facing lions, um, but the trials still remain. Let me give you some examples of the type of trials a Christian might face in today's society. An honest employee is fired for disrupting a company's plans to scam consumers or for blowing the whistle on corruption and fraud. A law enforcement officer is ostracized and pushed out of line for promotion by her fellow officers because she refuses to lie in order to cover up misconduct by another officer. Or a college student, the only Christian in her family, is excluded from family activities because after her graduation, she disappoints and embarrasses them by joining a missions organization working in the inner city rather than taking on a good job. A high school student experiences hostility because of taking a, a stand in an environment where social status and standing is heavily dependent on the extent to which one uses alcohol or drugs or is sexually active. A family refuses to buy into the consumer mentality of the culture. They come off as odd and are rejected by neighbors and friends. A teacher refuses to give a higher grade to a student who doesn't deserve it, even though the parents have demanded it, and then they report her to the administration as unhelpful and unfriendly. A person who has a pro-life ethic and is opposed to abortion and the death penalty finds himself part of a persecuted minority. This is the way it could play out in America. In some other countries, it could be much worse. In countries like Laos, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Sudan, Pakistan, and China, for example, it is dangerous, if not illegal, to practice Christianity. And afflictions similar to those that the Thessalonians suffered are to be expected. In modern days, this would include things like church burnings or closings, harassment, fines, arrest, and imprisonment. These are a constant danger and reality for Christians in those countries. Not only that, but it's estimated that more Christians have died for their faith in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries combined. Forced to deny Christ in order to live, they chose to confess Christ and were killed. They bore witness to him as a crucified Messiah and they bore witness to their hope in the life to come. Peter said this to the church in the first century. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. First John, do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. In the United States, to see Christians as the cultural majority is misleading, even if the majority of people would state Christian on the census form. Those who would actually classify themselves as born-again Christians is a much smaller group and a definite minority. Christians are extremely underrepresented in many of the culture-shaping influences of today's society, such as education, entertainment, media, and the arts. The Ben Stein movie, Expelled, examined the idea of academic freedom in higher education and found out that there is virtually none when it comes to the debate over intelligent design. 
The movie tells stories of professors fired for promoting or even exploring the possibility of intelligent design as an alternative to Darwinism. In our universities or even our tech companies, you will find that most people are not open to Christianity and see it as backward, unsophisticated superstition. This is a society that is becoming increasingly hostile to Christians and Christianity. Do not be surprised if you face trials. Do not be surprised if you face persecution for your faith. When you keep in step with Jesus, you will be out of step with the world, and the world will not like it. Amen. Let's pray. No, no, I can't leave it there. It feels a bit gloomy so far, doesn't it? It gets better, don't worry. N not soon, but later. Um, now, in a sense, um, the persecution and trials of this nature are obvious, and we can be clear-eyed and clear-minded about them. When it gets difficult is when we are not persecuted by the culture, but we are seduced by the culture. That's the next fill-in on your outline, seduced by the culture. There are certain values in the culture that are not so clearly in opposition to the church, but nevertheless, we need to be very careful about them. Values such as entertainment, materialism, and tolerance. And you could say, well, what's wrong with those things? We'll see. These can enter into Christianity and distort it to the point where it's a different gospel, either in form or in substance. Entertainment is a tricky one because, of course, at a certain level, we want church to be interesting and exciting and attractive. But taken too far, a church service can become a performance and a show. I do like the fact that in this church, people can make mistakes on stage and no one really cares that much. Because if it were a show and that happened, and <gasps> someone departed from the script or that transition wasn't smooth, we throw that stuff in deliberately so as not to be a show. <laughs> Just in, case, just in case you were wondering. Um, the Babylon Bee is a Christian satirical website which pokes fun at some of the excesses of Christianity. And this was one of their recent articles. Let's just see the image there. Some guy rudely interrupts Sunday morning concert with lame speech. Um, let me read it to you. Denver, Colorado. According to eyewitnesses at local church concert venue, The Awakening, some guy got up and launched into a lame speech right in the middle of the concert Sunday morning, totally and completely killing the mood for those in attendance. I think I just did that. Um, the, highly the highly skilled rock band had reportedly just finished a quiet, powerful ballad, bringing many of those in attendance to tears when the disturbance occurred. Talk about inappropriate, one man said after the concert. We like came here to be entertained, not lectured at by some guy. Way to harsh my mellow, whoever you are. <laughs> Other concert attendees expressed similar sentiments, wondering who the random guy was who came up and talked about whatever for 20 minutes. 20 minutes, they got off light. Um, <laughs> let me show you this next one. Entire city engulfed in artificial fog after megachurch leaves door open. Uh, this is a... <laughs> New York City, the, en the entire New York metropolitan area was blanketed in a bizarre manufactured fog for several hours Sunday morning after staff at Baywatch Church accidentally left a foyer door cracked open, allowing the artificial mist from the church's Sunday service to billow out into the community. The church uses a specially modified fog machine designed to pump out 400 times the recommended amount of fog in addition to a proprietary, specially concentrated formula for the machine's fluid, allowing the church to create a dense, moody atmosphere every service. <laughs> but when an usher failed to close a door all the way, the church suddenly found itself supplying its state-of-the-art, worshipful fog to the entire community. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Coming next week. Um, <laughs> Now, I find that funny because there's more than a hint of truth to it. I have been to a church where uh, it does seem more like a concert, where there is the smoke and the light show and everything else, and it feels more like a concert, and the sermon does feel like an interruption. But it's dangerous for the church because it's seductive. Out of a legitimate desire to make a church service appealing, we go too far, and now it's not about worship, conforming ourselves to the image of Christ, being challenged by truth, now the measure of success is how entertaining it was. And one of the problems with that is that we cannot compete with Hollywood and Disney. Our budget does not compare. And if the measure is entertainment, we will lose every time. There are more entertaining things you can do on a Sunday morning than be here. Or what about the cultural value of materialism 
and the pursuit of wealth. This is what the Bible says about it. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The largest church in America is Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas, led by Joel Osteen, pastor and author of Your Best Life Now. Weekly attendance is around 52,000 people. Osteen says that if you want to be rich, you have to go beyond pure belief. You have to speak it into existence. In his book, Your Best Life Now, he says this. If you want success, if you want wisdom, if you want to be prosperous and healthy, you're going to have to do more than meditate and believe. You must boldly declare words of faith and victory over yourself and your family. God will make you prosperous if only you declare words of victory. That sounds like faith in faith rather than faith in Jesus. Um, Albert Moeller, um, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote an article where he examined the teaching of this church, and this is some of what he said. Um, Joel Osteen's wife, Victoria, also shares the pulpit. In her message, Victoria Osteen, Joel's wife, tells their massive congregation to realize that their devotion to God is not really about God, but about themselves. I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we are happy. That's the thing that gives him the greatest joy. She continued, so I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen? Can you see how that is a very man-centered gospel rather than a God-centered gospel? As you might predict, the congregation responded with a loud amen. America, this is Albert Moeller still speaking, not me. America deserves the Austins. The consumer culture, the cult of the therapeutic, the marketing impulse, and the sheer superficiality of American cultural Christianity probably made the Austins inevitable. The Austins are phenomenally successful because they are the exaggerated fulfillment of the self-help movement and the cult of celebrity rolled into one massive megachurch media empire. And to cap it all off, they give Americans what Americans crave, reassurance delivered with a smile. Judged in theological terms, the Austin message is the latest and slickest version of prosperity theology, which is basically the belief that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and happy. The Austins are dangerous precisely because they aren't dangerous. They preach of a faith that fits right into society and brings immediate happiness, health, and wealth to all who follow it. But the true faith is one that rebels against our culture, challenges us to endure the hardships of life and the hatred of our peers, eviscerates our apathetic nature, interferes with our plans, commands us to confront our sins, and generally makes everyone very uncomfortable. It is a dangerous, terrifying, beautiful, joyful, harrowing, redemptive thing. It's real, a blazing wildfire that will consume and purify the entire world. That's Albert Moeller. This type of gospel is dangerous because it takes a biblical truth that God desires to bless us and minimizes that to material earthly blessing in this world and makes that the goal. It's dangerous because it's a call to happiness rather than a call to holiness. It's dangerous because it puts me and my happiness at the center rather than Christ and his commands. It's dangerous because it's a gospel that actually has nothing to say about suffering and which would be completely irrelevant to Christians suffering in countries that are less wealthy than America. This would not preach well in South Sudan. It's a false gospel. It's heresy. My Jesus says, pick up your cross and deny yourself. That's not a message you will hear at that church. It's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament that speaks to this from Ezekiel. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will not belong to the council of my people or be listed in the records of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the sovereign Lord. Because they lead my people astray, saying, peace where there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Prosterity preachers preach peace, but they are leading people astray. They are building a house with flimsy walls and whitewash, and there is no safety in that house. People argue and say, well, isn't it better that people get at least a, something of Christianity through this church? Christianity that does not have a cross is not Christianity. Christianity that does not have a theology of suffering is not Christianity. Enough said about that. 
But what about one of the most promoted values in society today, tolerance? Now, on the surface, this appears to be a value that would accord well with Christianity. We want to honor and respect others and their opinions. So far, so good. But tolerance demands more than that. Tolerance requires that we say every opinion and every lifestyle is equally valid. And as a Bible-believing Christian, I cannot agree with that. I cannot say that certain lifestyles, which the Bible calls sinful, are now okay because we're supposed to be tolerant. And when certain respected Christian authors and speakers come out and say they're now in favor of gay marriage, they have elevated society's value of tolerance above biblical truth. And it's dangerous because it seems kind. It's dangerous because it seems like the decent thing to do. But how kind and decent is it really to tell people that God is fine with their lifestyle when the Bible clearly tells us that he is not? How kind is it really to call sin not sin? It gives me really no pleasure to talk about these things, but I am your shepherd. And flock of central, sometimes I use my staff to lead you to the green grass, and sometimes I use it to beat away the wolves. And today is a beating away the wolves kind of day. The wolves of entertainment, materialism, and tolerance that will gnaw away at the integrity of the gospel. And it's my duty to warn you of these things. And Paul was thinking about the persecution and trials in the activity of Satan in endangering the Thessalonian believers. I believe I've just outlined some of the persecutions, the trials, and the dangers that we face as Christians in Silicon Valley in the 21st century. We may face persecution from the culture. We may have to withstand seduction from the culture. But there is good news. We don't face this alone. We get to do it together. We get to do it as a team Suffering and persecution become much more endurable when you're not going through it alone. What Paul commands the Thessalonian church to do is increase and overflow in love. We are called to strengthen and encourage one another in the midst of trials and persecution. This is the very reason Paul sent Timothy to them. Verse 2, he says, We sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. In times of trial and persecution, we need each other for strength and encouragement. Paul puts it this way in verse 12. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. So the call of Christ is for us to live counterculturally. And we resist peer pressure with peer pressure. We resist the pressure of society with the positive, uplifting pressure of Christian community. This week and next week on the patio, you will have the opportunity to sign up and join one of our life groups. These are small groups that meet throughout the week to study God's word together, to pray for each other, to listen to each other's stories, to share our lives together. And in these environments, we find strength and encouragement. In my own life group, Quite often, as someone will share a situation that they're facing in their life and say, I don't know as a Christian what the right way is to deal with this. I'm tempted to go this way, but the Bible says this. How, how do I work this out as a Christian? And the wisdom of the group comes together and supports and encourages, and that's the way it should be. The Christian life was not designed to be lived solo. God has called us not only to himself, but to this family of believers. We need each other. We need each other's perspectives. We need each other's prayers. Paul and Timothy were a model of this for the Thessalonians. The last thing I want to talk about this morning is may God clear the way. Now, this would be easy to overlook because it's just a small phrase in the whole passage. We find it in verse 11. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. There's a couple of things to note about this. The first exciting one is this, the this is the first written record we ever have of Jesus being invoked in a prayer. Previously, a good Jew like Paul would have only called upon God, but here Jesus is included. And the other part, which I find exciting, is his belief that in the face of trials, in the face of obstacles, in the face of opposition, God is able to clear the way. I love that. I love it that when Paul is in this situation and he can't see a way through, when he's in a situation and he doesn't know how he can solve it, he knows that God can. I love that Paul understands the limits of his own ability, but he knows that God has no limits. 
And this morning, I believe many of us are facing obstacles in our life. It may be persecution. Maybe we've been seduced by the culture and made some poor decisions that are not pleasing to God. Maybe there's some circumstance we are facing and we have no idea how we're going to get through it. Church, God can clear the way. He is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. There is no mountain too high for him. There is no valley too low for him. God is able. And Paul had an absolute rock solid faith in this. For you this morning, there may be a situation you're facing in your life and you say, there's no way. There's no way this can be resolved. I believe this morning God can make a way. We're going to have an extended time of prayer this morning. Um, As we come to the end of the service, the band is going to play two songs and the prayer team is going to come down front and while you're singing, we're going to be calling on God to clear the way. If you're facing a situation in your life where you need God to act, where you need God to clear the way, then come on down and we will storm the heavenlies together. We're going to do some business in prayer this morning. We're going to break down some strongholds. We're going to move some mountains. And we're going to do it with faith in the God who loves us and cares for us and is able to clear the way. You know, sometimes as Christians, we can be tempted to be sort of passive, almost fatalistic, like, well, I guess that's just the way life is and God will work it out. And today I feel more aggressive than that. Today I feel that we need to do some battle. The the Bible talks about the fact that Christians face three enemies. Uh, The first is the flesh, which is our sinful human nature. The second is the world and the pressures that it puts on us, and I've talked about that this morning. And the third is the devil, that we have a spiritual enemy who is opposed to us, opposed to our lives. And I think this morning, As we pray, we are going to bring in some heavy artillery. There's a great quote which I love, which says, Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of God. So we are going to pray. We're going to be the slender nerve which moves the muscle of God to clear away some obstacles this morning. So let me pray now. Um, The band is going to come up and start playing, and then the prayer team is going to be down here. If you're facing some obstacle in your life, you want God to move a mountain this morning, then come forward and we'll pray together. Lord God, thank you that you are a God who is able to keep us strong through persecution, who is able to make us alert to the seductions of society. But God, this morning, I want to thank you most of all that you are a God who can clear the way. Paul believed that, and we want to declare our faith in you this morning. We want to declare our faith in that. So God, as we come to prayer now, I pray that you will open the heavens to us, that you will pour down your blessing that you'll pour down your mercy and your grace on our lives and that you will break through, that you will break down any strongholds that the world or the enemy or our flesh has placed in our lives. God, that you will move mountains. In Jesus' name.